covered. Uh, okay, so we are live with Adam Goldman. <laughs> so how are you today? Very good, Sonny. Um, how are you? I'm well. I'm well as well. I think we were just quickly chatting earlier about you know how it's a good day for for Bitcoin maximalists and Bitcoin diehard sure. people. So uh, sure. we can start on that topic. I mean, you know, how how is Bitcoin doing today? Uh, Bitcoin's up uh, almost two percent. It smashed above that in a twenty four hour, but it's sort of facing the twelve k resistance. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're in BTC, today is a good day. And if you've been sort of waiting for this from the early parts of the summer, I mean, this is, this is sort of validating for you, definitely for sure. But, uh, you know, alts are getting crushed. DeFi is getting crushed. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just, you know, a function of the dominance play, you know, with every, everything that's going on with world events and economic responses to COVID-19, it's, it's not something that would be unforeseen, I would say. Mm, mm. So cool. So we're going to touch on, uh, I guess, a lot of these things. So, But let's start with maybe, you know, for a lot of people, at least in my sphere, who don't maybe know you or your story, sure. specifically, you know, kind of your story, I would love to, to, yeah, give you that opportunity to kind of just, you know, say it how it is. <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, I'll give you a little uh, Adam, Adam Goldman story. Um, I think maybe it's worth starting around my my high school days, I won't go too deep, but uh, I um, I did go to a military boarding school for high school uh, for, for the last three years of my high school and graduated from there. Um, I learned a lot of things about other people and about uh, various different structures of, of um, you know, any types of groups of people, teams of people, chains of commands, things like that. Uh, definitely was in the best shape of my life during those days. Uh, subsequently, after graduating from military school, I decided to go to a university on the east coast of Canada called mm. Dalhousie University. Um, just like all of my heroes in technology, I subsequently dropped out of university in my third year while I was studying political science. My rationale for that was simply I wanted to go and make money. Um, I wasn't learning fast enough in university, if you could believe that. Uh, and so, I, you know, I came home. I found a great draw, um, a great job in the construction industry, actually, but doing IT stuff for a bunch of contractors. I was digitizing their estimates, their quotes, um, and, and sort of cleaning up the, the final delivered contract to, to any customer um, who would seek a quote. Uh, and then, of course, about uh, 14 months after that, the, the 08 economic crisis sort of reared its head and the whole world went into self-preservation mode. And um, obviously not having a degree from university didn't help my case. Uh, so I sort of just took some of my um, time that I had around and, and, and tried to go to some technical schools to sort of beef up any type of credentials that, that may help me do what I want to do. And I wanted to go into, you know, computers, technology, networking, internet, anything tech was sort of something I'd been fascinated with from my early teens. So, um, so I did go to college, a uh, technical college where I learned network systems technology. I got a few Microsoft certifications. I studied various um, Cisco paths and a few other paths um, within taking any type of uh, course like that. So, so being a, kind of a network internet analyst. Um, so around that time, I actually ended up uh, working for a, for a web hosting company. And this is sort of the sort of transition into where my crypto career starts. So I worked at a web hosting company um, that was local in Toronto. And that sort of, um, you know, took what I learned at technical college to the max. Uh, and uh, funny enough, one of the the main CTO over there, the programmer, who is a, uh, not just your average programmer, but more of a, a um, an academic with a background in scientific mathematics. And so when you're a programmer and you have a background in scientific math and then, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies enter your hemisphere, it's almost like light bulbs going off. And, and so him and I sort of became very fascinated, not only with technology, but of course, you know, philosophical undertones and why it was created, what it was created for, what it's going to do and what it's going to fix and who it's going to help. And it was just very, um, very attractive to both of us, you know, being nerds, if you will. And. Um, we, we sort of took it upon ourselves to try to figure out how are we going to get into to Bitcoin and into crypto. We weren't so fascinated with sort of mining it or anything like that. Um, so what we did was we we sort of uh, 
sort of had a look around the Canadian landscape. And there were, there were a few early players in crypto that had set up some, some pretty cool looking projects. Um, and, and when I mentioned this time, this is the sort of 2014 era, 2013, 2014, mm-hmm. 2015, I guess would be the tail end of that. But, um, you know, it was back in the Canadian heyday where, you know, Ethereum hadn't been uh, launched yet. Uh, one of the main exchanges was an exchange called CA Vertex, which of course, you know, was acquired by Kraken. Um, there was also uh, there was also another player in the space, which not too many people remember, but uh, it was an exchange called Vault of Satoshi. Um, they had a great product, very clean interface, a bunch of great people working for them. Uh, and so the initial product that my original partner and I sort of thought, thought we should build was um, almost a copy of another service called QuickBT. Um, and so I definitely would uh, would mention, you know, Jamie Robinson and QuickBT as, as being a little bit of an inspiration for, for myself and showing us, uh, you know, a pretty simple model that we could build something. And so we sort of did that to as long as we could before the Interact online payment method sort of was uh, deprecated by the Interact network. Um, and, and just for people who may be watching who don't know what Interact is, so just think of Interact as a unified debit network in Canada that all the banks participate. And um, it was initially set up as a, as a, as a non-for-profit. It's a now a for-profit company. And I think that's a little bit better for them because they've been trying to evolve Interact into a much more modern payment rail. Um, and then so going back to, to Interact online, um, so Interact Online kind of comes before e-transfers or email money transfers. It was effectively like a real-time driven payment API in which you would authenticate against your bank and, and you could complete all those transactions pretty much the same way a credit card transaction happens. And and not using the same technology or backends, but just from a UX perspective, it was a real-time cleared payment like that. Um, so that went pretty well, but uh, you know, as as Bitcoin's price began to appreciate, you know, companies who were selling twenty, fifty, hundred dollars, two hundred fifty dollars worth of crypto, um, you know, that was only attracted to X market segment. And um, the goal had always been to try to do more of a Coinbase type flavor, where you would have an account and you would have a much more fluid user experience. So. Um, it's pretty pretty challenging during the um, 2015 2016 stretch uh, for us. We we didn't see too much traction on InstaBT per se, but we didn't give up. And and you know as we sort of thought about that more and what I just mentioned about Coinbase, we 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 were able to reboot the brand um, with some new resources, some new partners, and that that's what is now known as Bitbuy. And so Bitbuy came out in 2016 with its new colors, uh, its new UX. Even during that time frame, if you were an exchange for the last year or two, um, merchant services was getting pretty hot in the crypto exchange space. So every exchange uh, on the planet just developed a quick API so that we could add you know, payment functionality offerings to the marketplace. And so we, we went ahead, we built one of those. Uh, we even went so far as to do some some pretty cool things with some physical hardware terminals where we were able to integrate our API into some of the um, OS level apps sitting on pin pad payment terminals. Um, but that was more novel than anything because there's a huge regulatory aspect of that business of having chip and pin certifications and which banks feel comfortable with using them, et cetera. Um, but that's now all coming to fruition, as I see in, in, in other segments of the market to which we're not we're not too involved in. But, you know, those were just sort of early, early darts that we had thrown at the wall and, um, you know, tried to see um, if these pieces of inf- infrastructure were, were, were sort of what the, what the market was asking for. Um, so we kind of stuck it out, um, you know, 2016 uh, wasn't too exciting. Crypto began to obviously rise and appreciate. And then obviously by 2017, that was, uh, it was uh, quite a euphoric time in Bitcoin's history when those ATHs were, were, were met and sort of the, you know, 2017 and uh, um, early 2018. And then of course the house of card comes crashing down a little bit. I hate to say house of cards, but you know, a lot of the ICO alts were a big reason for that. So, you know, for the ones that didn't really stick around, the sort of the non-file coin ones, I guess, um, you know, 
that was a, that was a big bubble um, in that element, or at least in that time frame, and, and there was a lot of FOMO going on. Um, but nonetheless, the market crashed, and uh, you know we had we had different plans. You know, prior to the market crashing, the market crashed, and we sort of had to do what we had to do, and again go into a bit of a preservation mode and buckle down and lean get get a little leaner than we had been before and we just sort of put our heads down and continued to execute on our roadmap which was just building our product you know getting closer to the biggest players in the space as far as you know how it feels and how it works and um and uh in 2017 um my previous partners uh, who who we found the company with we we sold the company to uh to an investment group um, who was pretty bullish on on crypto, and uh, I had I had agreed to come along with them, and and uh, it was really at that point that the company began to um, get some more resources in order to scale up. It was very interesting that that sort of happens as the market crashes because it was sort of a miss on the euphoric rise in the quarter or two before. Uh, but nonetheless, we we did exactly that. We built, we kept building at our product, um, kept moving at our team, and then in 2018. Uh, we came across a, uh, an opportunity to make an acquisition of another company that was founded here in Toronto um, by another crypto OG, no less, a gentleman by the name of Chris Marsh, who was an early Syscoin founder and investor, um, wanted to get into the space and, and build an exchange. And so um, it's been a great, great deal of time and, and, and effort building a, a great product, a a great stack of technology um and uh, unfortunately um you know not having that product in the market as as the 2017 era had reached its peak was uh was uh, disheartening to say the least um so we had an opportunity to uh to acquire blockchain markets and its proprietary technology and uh bring chris on board into the bit by story and um what we did was spent the next, I would say, few quarters figuring out how to merge our two entities and, and and leverage all those resources and cut out what wasn't needed and add what was needed and and we did end up bringing that product to market and that is now what you see as Bit by Pro, and so Bit by Pro has been a huge driver for our business, for our revenue growth, uh, for our volume growth and our customer growth, um, and it really helped sort of solidify our offering as a complete CFI exchange. Um, the vision for BitBuy, of course, was to focus on Canada. Um, that may be sexy or not to certain business people amongst the world, but we still believe that uh, it's definitely worth um, going through, uh, you know, the environment here in Canada to come out on the other side with what we think should be a standard Bitcoin offering or cryptocurrency offering in, in a in a jurisdiction such as Canada. So. Yeah, that's a little bit about sort of my story and how my story folds into a little bit of the beginning of of, of how BitBuy comes to be, and uh, and uh, it's really all about sort of continuing that on now. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so that that's fascinating. Uh, I was gonna say so uh, on the BitBuy side of things. Well, two questions. First of all, can you go a bit more into uh, so people can buy Bitcoin and they can buy you say cryptocurrencies, but like what what is kind of the full range? And then my follow up question was gonna be like. What's been like your biggest challenge in build, like as an entrepreneur, you know, <clears throat> building a Bitcoin business and trying to do sure. it in like a legit, you know, like uh, it's really hard to maintain a good reputation, you know, in this space, right? Especially for yeah. an extended period of time. And the one thing I've noticed about Bitbuy and with just this the team and everything is, is that you guys have kind of earned people's trust. It's funny that, you know, we work with like trustless like currencies <laughs> and all that, but um, at the end of the day, people need, or still to some extent, need to trust C five, as you said, right? Sure. So, so what, what's your, what, yeah, what's, but what's been your, you know, biggest lift or what your biggest challenge? What's the one thing that maybe you know has kept you up at night? Sure, I, I think, um, I think the biggest challenge, and and this would be more specific to, to crypto, of course, but um, you know, given the fact that it's a it's a new tech, it's a nascent industry. Um, you know, the regulatory uncertainty and the previous legal uncertainties in certain areas and elements of uh, different parts of crypto businesses has been very much of a challenge. I think uh, specifically, too, when I, I look at how Canada stacks up to the rest of the world, you know, Canada being the birthplace of Ethereum, 
um, was really known in the early days as sort of a, a blockchain startup hub. And, you know, our federal regulator, FinTrack, did actually release some guidance in early 2015. Um, but that guidance actually subsequently sent us all into limbo because it wasn't acted on and it, and it, and it didn't have a supporting framework underneath sort of the bullet point guidance that they had come out with. Um, and so that was probably the most challenging thing. Uh, it was nice to see them acknowledge it, but it was very challenging for what they said. And, you know, they just shoved a whole bunch of catch 22s in there, you know, most notable one being if you're a, a nationally chartered bank of Canada, you are forbidden from doing business with a, a crypto service provider unless they are registered with FinTrack as a money service business. But there was no virtual asset framework for crypto businesses to register as a money service business. And so that just scared the banks. And from a risk perspective, you know, they're not going to risk, um, you know, core elements of their business to take a very small percentage of new business. And, you know, I don't like to say small percentage as a down play on you know what bitcoin is doing or how crypto is doing because obviously it's ripping right now and the liquidity in the last two years alone has just dwarfed its its previous history um and especially who wants access to crypto as well too um but uh but it was really that it was really a little bit of a catch-22 fork that put a lot of people in limbo um subsequently uh events played out in canada that 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 could be attributed to a lack of guidance i mean we did have quite a few operators in the space who you know even though they weren't uh quote unquote reputable people or or whatnot i think that lack of guidance almost provides a covenant to some people who think that way and so um, I don't think that did Canada too good uh, in some of the examples that we that that had subsequently come after that, whether it was, uh, you know, Quadriga or whether it was a couple of operators who were um, dishonest about metrics or information about their business. Um, you know, that just that just that's just another nail in the coffin of trying to build trust. And so that history in Canada has been quite challenging for us. Um, but being patient um i think is is sort of how you you navigate that and and you just can't really you can't really take no for an answer and i don't mean no for an answer when the regulator of the bank says no but when they say no to something you just gotta pit you gotta figure it out there's always another if there's always if there's a will there's a way so um you know that approach i think has served us well the ethos of that kind of aligns with how crypto people think um as well and and so I don't think um, trying to rush anything in crypto has benefited anyone. I mean, obviously, there's 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 a lot of people who got lucky entering the markets at specific times and whatnot. But most of the OGs in crypto and all of the success, successful projects and companies, et cetera, have have grinded their way there. Um, and so that's just you know sort of a basic truth. I think that a lot of people overlook when they think that crypto is some super advanced non um i can't understand this technology because it's so high tech and crypto and um you know i i think uh you know that that was one of the biggest challenges and and the thing that the thing that i think makes um makes it a little more disheartening is to see our our brothers south of the border um brothers and sisters south of the border who were behind us back in the early days now have all released various different pieces of federal guidance whether it's from the sec or the irs or the cfdc or or whatnot um you know they're just america's america's moving like we all know america moves and they don't wait for anyone and i'm very surprised that 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 action got um you know addressed in in various united states jurisdictions before we addressed those things up here um so we're we're fighting the good fight um and uh you know i'm definitely optimistic definitely long you know uh, one regulatory jurisdiction will not diminish my overall long you know bullish case for why i think bitcoin and and you know i'm more of a crypto guy than specifically bitcoin i love bitcoin bitcoin is number one but i kind of love it all uh and and so i'm not going to sit here and say that i'm a, i'm i'm so maxi-esque uh, because you don't get alts in the rest of DeFi without bitcoin and so how could you say 
even on a um, evolutionary path um, that they're not related and so they are and so um, obviously when we get into analytics and metrics and whatnot you know we talk about correlation and everything like that and where the money is and whatnot but uh, but you know I think I think all these other cryptos are just Pandora's box has been opened um, so so yeah, I, I was it. gonna ask you about that. I was gonna ask you about that. So 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 one of the things I, I love thinking about and exploring is kind of like okay. So, so oh, by the way, I I have to show yeah, everybody yeah, yeah. on the call here this. I'm wearing my oh, OG 2014 Ethereum shirt oh, that I got from Vitalik at the 2014 Bitcoin oh. Expo, and I'm pretty sure it has like a there's a snippet of code on the back, and it says how to create your own currency. So I definitely love them all. Sorry to cut you off there. Go ahead. Interesting, interesting. Actually, where were you during those days? Uh, so that so you you were like right there, front and center for for kind of the, the what year was Ethereum launched in? I'm trying to remember. I'm pretty sure it was launched in 2015. I could be wrong, and it could be sort of the latter half of 2014. But I remember sort of Ethereum's buzz being generated um, during that time, and the foundation was created, and there was a lot of promotion going on, and the beta test nets were being worked on and the dev community was being built up and and so yeah it was it was sort of around that time and you know i i i uh gosh i wish i would have been more bullish on that specifically at that time um, but uh but yeah i remember seeing the ethereum team and they were really excited and they had mountains of t-shirts at that that expo and it was very interesting it was one of the first conferences ever uh in canada um, that had anything to do with crypto which conference it was it? the 20 Which... it was the 2014 bitcoin expo it was, was it... and it was at, oh yeah 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 of and it was at the toronto mm -hmm. convention show and sponsored by crypto kit and decentral there were lots of anthony. yeah there was anthony and there were lots of other companies involved there were even a lot of mainstream companies that were giving talks there i remember shopify sent some people to give a talk there um CA Vertex had a booth. I was there. there. I yeah, was yeah. there. I, I totally remember. Yeah, it was yeah. like a, a walk down memory lane. Yeah, man. <laughs> and so, you know, that was one of the ones that kind of really showed me like the physical element of it. You know, after discovering crypto mm. online and this and that, it's like, wow, there's a whole community here. Uh, and then subsequently after that, you know, I'd gone to a bunch of different meetups at Decentral and just trying to expand the network and just trying to meet people and, uh, yeah, the the that heyday. Awesome. Yeah, that heyday then was uh, was a great time to to start meeting people and building relationships. So how do you how do you, okay? So so um, there's kind of like these two extremes, right? To uh, like to our industry in the sense that there's like Bitcoin, right, which is like this beacon of light. It's like sure. You know, um, it's something that's been around for a long time, sure. perhaps like the best performing asset in the last 10 years. Uh, it's got like this decentralized community, no real like even godlike figure. It's like it's just it's just it's living up to that vision. Right. Um, and then on the other kind of far extreme, you've got like Ruja of one coin and like straight up like scamming people and like pyramid schemes and, sure. you know, just like uh, smoke and mirrors. Um, but then there's like this whole world in between, right? And, and it could be argued to some extent that that Ethereum has helped usher in that, whether you, it be ICOs, now it's DeFi. Sure. But how do you, in your mind, uh, like what's your framework for, for thinking about this world in terms of like, yeah, like how do you even navigate it, right? Like I, I, like I consider myself a bit of a Bitcoin like maximalist and like you, I was there front, and like front row uh, with the whole Ethereum thing and and really didn't like see it for what it was and, and sure. kind of just like threw it into like a don't care pile until I had to, I, I guess I right. would say. Um, but yeah, but I'm just curious, like how, and then, and then like I said, just the final kind of piece of this question is the DeFi thing is like, how does that fit in? Is it another kind of like ICO thing again? Or do you see some real innovation here? Do you think people should be paying attention? Anyways, I'll pause so, there. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I think with respect to the to the DeFi, you know, DeFi now versus ICO bubble, then I think that was more of a function of you know the flaws in in man or in humans, um, you know, to just take advantage of other people who got excited. 
um, just like the one coin thing, like BitConnect, you know, like I, I to watch to go and play the clip from the BitConnect. Um, BitConnect. Thing, that oh guy? my god, <laughs> that guy, that guy. Is, well, he's a he's a meme now, right? And um, you know, I, I obviously there's going to be that, um, but I think DeFi is different from 2017. I think really because of the evolution of the technology itself, we're now at a stage where what is actually being built now was just an idea on a piece of paper in 2017. And Ethereum itself may not have had the stability per se to enable what's going on now in DeFi uh, until the maturity it has achieved by simply you know, being around and being worked on and going through its different iterations. And so um, I think that, I mean, I, I think Ethereum is brilliant. I think um, what it enables which to me is is a lot of the future of finance. Like, okay, people say, oh, Bitcoin maxis, oh, Bitcoin is king, okay, great. I love that. I love Bitcoin, et cetera. Um, but is that how we're going to just limit what these, you know, if Bitcoin is the original DeFi, it can only do X, Y, Z, et cetera. And yes, it has community and yes, they can develop it. But if we want to compare development timelines, um, organizations like Ethereum, are able to develop a lot more and expand their communities a lot bigger, um, probably because of the scope being a lot wider, um, giving a lot more potential to what can be done in said network versus Bitcoin. And so I don't think that's a knock on Bitcoin. And I don't think it's a knock the other way. And I don't think it's a knock the other way to say, oh, Ethereum is, you know, will make Bitcoin, you know, irrelevant or look like a peon I, I don't think they're even really comparable and i think that's maybe you know to answer another question you asked me earlier that's one thing that a lot of people don't see is that they're trying to compare all these alts with bitcoin and yes of course there's a technological significance and similarity to kind of how they are implemented or built um, but what they do and who they're built by and run by there is a vast difference between communities and peoples and then the ideologies of maxis versus not maxi and so i think that's sort of one of the things i would say that i think is true and that people are missing right now uh is that they're trying to compare the apples and oranges together and that just won't freaking work because i like apples and i like oranges too and so do other people and it doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be equated with each other they taste different. They look different. They do different things. Um, maybe at their core, there's a lot of similarities, of course, um, or at least in their roots, there's some similarity. Uh, but, you know, I was, you know, I think, uh, I think, I think effectively is Ethereum is thinking about crypto and Bitcoin as example number one, and then what else can it be? Or what, you know, I, maybe with respect to Vitalik specifically, there were a lot of things that he wanted to improve in Bitcoin that he was maybe not able to, that he was able to do with Ethereum. But, you know, to that specific point, let's say the Bitcoin community would have allowed such work and development to go on in Bitcoin. You may not have Ethereum. And then Ethereum and Bitcoin may be this one thing that's not two things that they are today. And so... You know, I, I really, I, I, I understand maximalist, but I don't think, you know, being a crypto, it makes sense to be a specific coin maximalist because we're just getting started. And, you know, think about what's going to happen in another 10 years from now and another 10 years from that. I mean, this will just keep getting worked on and developed and improved and weak players will be weeded out of the space. The scams will be uncovered, the feds will go after the criminals, and, and we'll arrive at 2.0s and 3.0s and 4.0s. Um, so I mean, I, I don't I don't knock them together. And then I think specifically, again, back to Ethereum a little bit, I think Ethereum sort of scope and mission goals um, are to enable a lot of things beyond what Bitcoin is offering us. And so you know, it's amazing to even think of the concept of an automated hedge fund that isn't run by people and it's run by algorithms and contracts and computers and secured by cryptography. And it's just, you know, that is, that's a, that's unbelievable that we 
are now arriving at the MVPs for that and beyond MVPs for that. I mean, how many, how many of these things have you and I probably put personal money into already? So, you know, to put money into that, we have to have at least a bit of a wow factor on, you know, that's unbelievable. Automated market makers, hedge funds, uh, insurance platforms, all governed by coded, coded law. I mean, that is a, uh, it's a, it's a, excuse my language. It's a mind fuck and a half. And I thought it then, and I still think it now. And, and that's what, you know, kind of forever keeps me bullish on crypto in general. Yeah, that is, that's fascinating. Are there any new, uh, like super new projects that you're, I don't know, keeping an eye on or that you have an interest in? Um, just curious. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think, I mean, I'm late to this, but I, I'm really impressed with the Solana blockchain. Um, I think Solana is doing some really cool things and, and sort of, you know, basically doing, sorry, can you still hear me? I don't know. If 100%. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I heard Solana and, and yeah. but I'm just equally as uh, interested. So yeah, yeah continue. <laughs> so, so, I mean, and I think maybe Solana may, you know, Solana and Chainlink kind of could be close. Um, but, you know, I just, I really like, they're effectively thinking along the same process as Ethereum thought, as a Vitalik thought when he was a Bitcoin developer and said, now nah, there's some other things maybe I want to try to introduce. You know, I like these ideas. I want to do these things. And so having different mechanisms and, and solving a few of the problems that presented themselves in ETH, for example, that, that are kind of done away with in Solana, um, throughput, transactions per second, the, the speed of oracles and things like that, um, you know, I love that. That is, that's, that's what I expect from what we've signed up to be involved in. We expect this stuff to keep growing and growing and changing. And, you know, the road there is not going to be a straight line. Clearly we're going to have scammers, we have bubbles, we're going to have to interact with the real world, which is, you know, a perfect discussion point for how the COVID economy has affected crypto per se. Um, yeah, I, I've just, uh, I, I like Solana. I like, I like. And what are you, what are your thoughts since you brought up Solana? So what are your thoughts on, uh, you must've heard of project serum. Yeah. And so kind of like this decentralized exchange built on it. Are you, are you bullish on that? Yeah, like, I, how, how, and how does that impact, I guess, you know, c is like, like, you know, BitBuy. Sure. I think, um, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, the interesting thing is, you know, they've always said that the exchange with the exchange business, with the CFI exchange business, it's a race to the bottom, right? Because in the old days, we were charging, you know, double digit percentage markups, and then they fell to the high singles. And then, and then now it's just uh, who gets tightest on the basis points, which is more akin to FX markets, and traditional finance, and things like that. Um, and so I think what, um, what the DEX allows is sort of um, the ability for us to connect a lot of these places that are unconnectable. And so if you kind of take it back to like uh, Andreas Antonopoulos's, you know, great phrase of, you know, banking the unbanked, it's sort of the next level of that. It's like giving access to capital markets and investments and derivatives and whatnot to a whole section of people who, for whatever reason, whether it was consumer protection from regulators, which is obviously not something you want to step on. I think this helps sort of usher that in, right? This is the crypto side of the robo advisors and the Robin hoods and the wealth symbols. And obviously I, I wouldn't even compare those two in any sense of the realm. Um, but just from a, where they're fitting now into the way young people and younger generations are starting to want to access markets and investments is much different. And so when you have things like DEXs come about, um, that allows you to get access to liquidity, let's say outside of the jurisdiction of where a CFI um, has to limit itself to, um, you know, that's a great thing. I think the other thing too, is with respect to what I was saying about a race to the bottom in, in sort of the fee model for CFI exchanges, um, that basically, um, you know, it, it shows you that maybe the DEX was supposed to be there first. Um, but I think that, 
I think that a lot of people, you know, who are who are with the maxi philosophy that we're going to do away with, you know, we don't want to regulate crypto. We don't, you know, the whole purpose of crypto is to not be regulated, et cetera, et cetera, from an ethos perspective. I think that is just not sort of reality. Uh, and I think that the CFI will stay around always in order to bridge the traditional mainstream into crypto. And then I think once people sort of understand that they can comfortably begin their journey at CFI, um, obtain assets, obtain coins and things like that, they can sort of go out into the world and, you know, come across the Uniswaps and the serums and say, oh, wow, I can get access to a whole bunch of things that I wasn't able to get access to on a CFI. And, you know, like as a as CFI exchange, I'd love to list every token from under the sun. Um, but obviously, I can't, um, nor should I. Because if the goal of the company is to end up with a mainstream standard offering that is usable by, you know, retail people and the masses and things like that, then I have to tread very carefully, of course. I can't just, you know, be putting Filecoin up uh, just because Gemini and Binance and, and everybody else is putting it up. Um, and so, yeah, there's um, there's a lot of things. But, yeah, the, you know, the DEX is... I just think DEXs are brilliant, just the way they work. Um, and it's funny hearing that from a CFI guy, which is talking about a product that effectively would cannibalize my product. Um, but I don't think it will, given the reality of the way that the landscape, the environment of traditional finance and legal jurisdictions work. Um, and so there's always going to be this middle ground. But there's been something, um, you know, internally from BitBuyer's perspective where we've been evaluating um, you know, how to interact with the DEX uh, and uh, maybe how to offer an offering as such to our clients as well. Um, nothing concrete in the works yet, but definitely some discussions are going on uh, for the last little while. And, you know, the reason why I brought up Solana before is because when we were evaluating things, um, you know, speed and congestion are sort of one of the two biggest things that, you know, I personally think would be an issue. Um, and from my own experience of sort of jumping into the DeFi craze and going on Uniswap and as, as brilliant as Uniswap is, it just, just doesn't really work the way it kind of should. And maybe, you know, that'll get solved with E2.0. It seems like it will, but um, it's interesting to see that there's other chains out there right now that are just not Ethereum and DEXs that are just not Uniswap um, that can actually solve those problems. And I think Serum is a perfect example of that. And the people behind it, I mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're crazy <laughs> smart. Yeah, they're crazy yeah. smart. Um, yeah, I mean, when it comes down to the Bitcoin maximalism, maximalism or whatever, just to just to kind of button that one up, like on my note, at least. Uh, look, I, I'm a I'm a fan of the free market. Uh, yeah. before I am of Bitcoin and I was sure. right? and I will continue to be if even if something bad happens to Bitcoin it's like sure. the idea of letting people battle out their own ideas and having the freedom to do so is like is is, is at my course I've always you know I, I even though I, I haven't ventured too deeply on a personal note I experiment obviously in in other assets um I, I justify that by 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 knowing that you know there are great ideas out there and it wasn't Correct. just you know just uh, just Satoshi. Um, okay, yeah, and Solana, man, that that one is is definitely super interesting. Um, yeah. So so I was going to ask you another question. So you kind of answered my question around you know or, or I don't know if you want to maybe take another stab at it as well. Is the question around like. Um, what like what's one truth that you hold or that you believe to be true that that most others in let's say you know the crypto or blockchain space space would maybe disagree with you on you know that's a that's a tough one but i think kind of kind of really how i said it before i think i think it seems like this this it's like you're either this or you're either that, or you're into this or you're into that, or you should only touch a couple, even if you're bullish on the whole space, pick your few, but some person's few are not the other person's few. And so I think this tribalism, which is obviously expected in the early days of anything, um, is something that I don't particularly subscribe to. Um, and that's sort of, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, viewers are going to see that from the way I'm answering some of these questions, but you know, I love Ethereum as much as I love Bitcoin. And, you know, not a lot of people would probably give an equal love for that, depending on 
how deeply they think about what these problems, these platforms solve and what they're going to do and what they're going to enable. But kind of to your point a minute ago about, I love the free market first. Well, that's kind of the, that's kind of the rationale for it. I mean, I want to see, I want to see everybody go in the arena and, and kind of duke it out. And, but I think even more so there isn't really a duke out that has to occur between all these different projects because a lot of them complement each other. A lot of them need each other. A lot of them wouldn't come without others before because they're simply just the same idea of a fork and then it added, you know, three things the original author didn't think about. And so therefore it made it a better product. Um, you know, that is free market capitalism at its finest. So if that occurring in cryptocurrency, you know, I support that. Like I love when, you know, Adam back is, is chirping Vitalik and so on and so forth, but <laughs> I love them both equally and I respect them both equally. And I think they're both right. And I can't remember who said that, but you know, when two good people argue over principles, they're both right. <laughs> yeah, Take I it guess. to a degree. Uh, Don't get as yeah, technologically yeah, I know granular. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Purely of course. From a did you? But on point. that note, on that note, on that note, did you recently watch the interview between Vitalik and Samson Mao on uh, what is Bitcoin? What, Peter McCormick? I forget his the name. I, I have yet to watch it yet. Check it out. Check yeah. it out. I thought it was I know, really a, good. It was good. Uh, yeah, it was really well done. And you know, yeah, I think Vitalik. Uh, yeah. He spoke his truth and, and Samson called him out on a few things. And, you know, uh, one, one thing. Well, that one, kinda... one, one mm. of the big things is, oh, okay, well, why was so much of it pre-mined, right? Was that one of them? I, I try to remember if that I mean, it was kind of a long interview. I, I forget the, the, the detail. What I, the one part, I don't know if that was brought up. I think it was actually. And that is a question that I, I kind of have as well. Okay. Um, I've, but here's yeah, my, yeah, I would here's, love to hear your answer for that one. By here's the way. my response. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Satoshi, one million coins. What's the difference? He mined it though. Okay. So it's not fair mined. Okay, fair enough. But he mined it when nobody was looking or gave a shit. So it was easy to mine it on your laptop very quickly before when there's just X amount of people participating in your community versus tens of millions, right? I mean, this is like hash rate mathematics. So um, I don't know. I. I don't really think that's neither a here nor there or a point to focus on per se, even though I know it's a strong one of contention for a lot of people. I mean, do, do, is it really so surprising um, when that's almost the status quo in traditional finance to give large chunks and lock up what was built to the people who built it? It's not a far stretch. Um, and maybe my point isn't well made per se, but okay, let's talk, let's, let's, let's do an example for a second. What if, what if it wasn't pre-mined? What if it, it all wasn't pre-mined? Can you still maybe hypothetically give me an alternative scenario and why that was better that it wasn't pre-mined? Like would ETH be 200 bucks or would it still be at 1200 bucks or because there wasn't so many uh, mass hodlers that people could see on chain about supply metrics that scares them about supply metrics. I mean, look at the economy that Ethereum has enabled. Never mind those pre-mined coins. Just irrespective of a point. I mean, even if he had 90% of those coins, I still think Ethereum would have enabled what it's enabling. So, you know, I think that's more of a personal beef anybody would have specifically um, with respect to that point. But yeah, yeah, know, so. yeah. No, no. I mean, these are all like, you know, I mean, up for debate, right? I don't think anything's really sure. super clear. I mean, I don't know if you heard uh, Vitalik like retweeted some SEC dude that was like, I love Ethereum, you know, last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Um, yeah, but uh, so, so sometimes I wonder though, it's like, well, what, they're going after these projects for raising money, right? for like a speculative project right and then but i see but ethereum i guess has met some sort of like test some litmus test right that, sure. that that i guess it's not um but i still i still kind of like have a bit of a 
uh, do not compute type of thing in my brain where it doesn't sure. always, always make sense. Um, uh, well, but uh, yeah, but, but, but on the point of like the, 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 the yeah, I agree with you. I, I think I think that is one sticky point. But, but one, one of the things that came up in that, and I actually kind of tweeted about it um, and then blogged about it afterwards, which was that Vitalik essentially at one point says that um, Ethereum doesn't stand for something like, you know, Bitcoin, it's like very clear what it stands for. Like, right. it's like, we talked about the free markets, right? So to me, and if you kind of build it up from first principles to have a proper free market, you need a proper money. Yep. It is one half of every transaction, meaning money is a critical component. And that is why I am so intrigued by Bitcoin. And it's not just, it's, technological innovation but it's also it's like philosophical and sure. you know what i mean it just brings so the, much to the table and it, and and you, you're a technical guy right you said you have like a technical background yeah i i have more of a technical background than a, you know what a unit step function is background. like you know you know unit step function Not, it's like when you go from yeah, zero yeah. to one it's like you can yeah, imagine yeah. that's sure. what bitcoin when i first saw it and like smelled it and like read the white paper it was just like Oh my God, like we just went from zero to one here. We went from like, we took all these like, you know, kind of separate ideas, brought them all together yeah. and voila, we have potentially like, you know, kind of the, the, the formation of like true free markets because money is being solved. I think the, the, reason I, I mean, the reason I kind of, when I first learned about it, it was like, if I really distill it down, it was that Vitalik was aiming to make a Turing complete Right. So like a, essentially like a, a language like programming. If so, if Bitcoin is a calculator and can do math and money really well, mm -hmm. he was like, yo, let's build, you know, kind of a Swiss army, like a, a programming language. If yeah. then the while virtual, it, a virtual global you could build VM. anything or you could build yeah. anything, anything that you can come up with, like a programming, you know, kind of. And, and, and my understanding was that, wait, hold on, wait. So is that not possible with Bitcoin? And if you peel the layer, you're like, you realize that, wait, hold on. It was not po it's not that it wasn't possible it was possible and even bitcoin you can do that but it was seen as an attack vector right as like it could be it just could make it like whether it's bloating of the blockchain whether it be sure. like just the fact that you could attack the network um sure. and and it was it one of the reasons that bitcoin maintained it. yeah maintained that and and it could also be argued that, you know, a lot of these like ICOs and things where people just started raising money was like spurred on by Ethereum, but it's not. It's just like you could do anything on Ethereum, right? And it yeah. kind of opened that door up. Um, have you heard if you have you heard about RSK, like rootstock and, and that like yeah. I, I always wonder um, like why why did that or why does why is that not <laughs> like a bigger thing, right? Like why wouldn't is it just not have you ever even played with it or I don't I know? I haven't played I should with know it, more uh, about it. Yeah, myself as well. Um, you know, I, I think I think a lot of the I think a lot of those projects also rear themselves when the blockchain, not Bitcoin hype, was very prominent in mm. introducing the mainstream to crypto. And so I think that's where you see uh, you know, obviously IBM gets excited, builds Hyperledger, and there, there were <laughs> there were several other yeah, yeah, yeah. there were several others that that, you know thought here's another layer here's another protocol that we can build that's sort of in line with the ethos but you know maybe it has more of an enterprise based applications the people behind it want to target you know whole industries and specific companies and and things like that um but you know i remember conversing with my original partner who's a mathematician he thought rsk was 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 pretty smart um, but I couldn't really speak to too much of it. And I think it's lack of adoption as well has, you know, caused guys like you and I to, to, to really not um, consider it in the full mainstream yet, even though it's been around for quite a while. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on it? On what, on what, on which one specifically? R RSK. I don't know. I've, I, I mean, I've, I've been aware of the project for some time. Sure. I know what they're doing. I know even Diego, I think he, I've even flown him up for one of my, one of our events when events used to be a thing. And uh, I always thought that thought it was fascinating, uh, but I was always curious as to why it's not, you know, just like more, taken off like that, why it hasn't, because it's like, wait, you can do a lot of that, but you can do it with sure. Bitcoin as an underlying layer. Um, sure. I think it's, I think it's just Ethereum is just more inherently, you know, programmable and, and therefore, you know, it, it's, it has a bit of a, a network effect as well. So, I mean, you know, sure. kudos to these guys. And, and so what, in the midst of this, um, like all this chaos, if you will, right? What do you see the role of 
you know, kind of an exchange operator or like a brokerage firm or whatever, like BIP buy. Because at the end of the day, you have to make a call on like what gets listed, for example, and what doesn't. Um, are you guys usually just looking at like, well, what's allowed by regulators? Or are you also kind of like pushing that border a bit and being like, wait, but there's like true innovation happening here, here, and here. And we've got to be listing them because like others are. And I don't know, like, do you feel that pressure? And like, how do you guys navigate that storm? I would say, um, you know, to be honest about who we are a bit by, that's probably one of our weak points at the moment. And something we're trying to address is the amount of assets that we offer. And because we are so concerned about the regulatory headwinds, um, we, be sh we, we usually try to be very sure. And when I, when I say very sure, this consists of obtaining multiple legal opinions for both internal and external counsel as to what our risk would be in, in listing such an asset. And so, um, you know, we're pretty comfortable with the, with the opinions that we've obtained and, the, and they're pretty well-known uh, opinions too, where, where our lawyers are not the only lawyers who, you know, obviously obtain those opinions. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think because there's a lack of clarity on that specifically, um, you know, that, that, and the MO of BitBuy is sort of keeping us a little bit pushed back on that front. Um, the, you know, when the ICO boom happened, it was like, we're not listing any ICO tokens in 2018, 2019. Um, unless it's very clear to find that, that this project has, you know, pure utility and that the initial offerings were not done via some construed interpretation of interacting with securities law, um, then we, we would feel pretty comfortable listing it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it hasn't been a, a focus for us because the main thing here is, is, is making sure that, you know, bit by continues to be number one. And, and then of course comes out on the other side, um, and either helping the regulators figure out what that guidance is going to look like. Um, you know, we, we're definitely, um, you know, being one of the, the, the bigger players in, in Canada, um, you know, it's definitely something that's sort of in our current, current, um, you know, goals for the company is to make sure that that's, you know, front and focus and that we don't step on any toes there and make sure that we're able to, you know, help evolve um, the lack of action, if you will, that that has come out of our regulators up here with respect to being compared to, let's say, American regulators at this point or any other jurisdiction around the world that's pretty favorable to, to crypto. Why do you think that is, by the way? And I've been in this scene since 2011, 2012. I've, I've seen the Canadian community. You know, regulators uh, used to come to my events again. Sure. Events were a thing. Um, I think, you know, is it, is it like, do you think it's like a, I don't know. Yeah. Is it a bit of like, oh, let's watch and watch and wait and let's just see what the American side says and then we'll follow suit. And I think it's, I'm not going to put I my, think it's more, my, you know, I think yeah, it's more yeah, political yeah, yeah. than anything. And I wouldn't say political in the sense that, you know, there's people that are against it. I think, um, with respect to any like big bureaucracy, for example, and then explicitly in Canada being the type of uh, structure that it is is parliamentary democracy uh, things move pretty slow here and the way things um, have been re-centralized over the last few decades under the guise of making it more efficient has actually had the opposite effect um, and I wouldn't specifically call out you know specific acts or things like that but it seems like when I speak with my government friends uh, at all levels that um, it's a function of information uh, and they just do not process it quick enough um, to then have it flow into any type of priority. And that's why it's political, as there are other priorities that these agencies who are going to be required to look at crypto, it's just not on the top of it right now. And I think it's kind of sad. You know, I mean, it took FinTrack five years from the time they, you know, five and a half years from Bill C-31 to the VASP requirement that came into effect in the earlier half of this year. That's not great. That's not fast in my opinion. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm definitely happy to help and, and we do help them and we do meet with them. And, you know, we do what we can for Canada. Um, but yeah, I think it's a function of understanding that information and then not acting on it and, and, and due to politics.
Um, and you know, that may be world events and whatnot, specific people in charge, but it just doesn't seem like anybody up in the high ups. Like we haven't really had many politicians in Canada versus politicians in the United States, like go on their Twitter and go, Hey, I just introduced a, a bill into the state house of this state, you know, where we want to deal with cryptocurrencies. Like we don't even have that. Like there is, it's all coming from the top down and there's a lot of waiting to see which um, agency goes first, um, you know, whether it's the CSA or the provincial securities regulators or the financial superintendent or things like this. And, and that's why my answer is strictly politics, because we're very forward thinking here in Canada and we've developed some amazing technology over the years and have had world firsts. But, you know, that that number one position or that lack of leadership it usually flows down to the inaction on the mass amounts of information that government needs to understand in order to, you know, keep the ball, keep the ball moving. So that's really what I, what I think it is. Um, it, it, and it's not like an explicit attack on Bitcoin or that they hate Bitcoin. They hate this because, you know, the feeling I get from when I speak with regulators and different government agencies is, you know, they really don't want to stifle in innovation. We have a we have a history of destroying our innovation here in Canada and selling it off and letting it leave the country or scooped up by other companies and things like that. And 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 um, you know they 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 definitely don't want to do that anymore with respect to a lot of technologically innovative businesses and industries. Crypto being one of them. Crypto and blockchain being one of them. So politics. Yeah, they don't they don't want to, but there's no one like literally in charge to make that happen. You know what Correct. I mean? Correct. Yeah. Um, and and I wonder why even like I mean, who would it be? It would be like the prime minister, right, or something that it, would eventually it, it would have, have to, to just pull the trigger. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, it would have something. to come 100 percent from the executive. So. Yeah, yeah, and and you know even uh, even um, sorry, Justin Trudeau's brother. Um, uh, is is you know a big Bitcoiner? He's been in crypto for a long time. Oh, I did not know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that should certainly help. Yeah, and you, you think, would think. Yeah, you'd think that you'd think that uh, they wake up to the fact that this. So, so what, what do you think? So, okay, so okay. One one really interesting thing that's happening now is that companies, public effing companies, big big ones, are putting Bitcoin. Uh, on their balance sheet, right? I don't forget this guy's name, Michael Saylor or whatever. He's just like, every day I wake up, my Twitter's like filled with him. Um, so, so what's your take on that? And then the second one is is more on like, what's the next thing? Like, is it central banks? No, no. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, let me go in, let me go in two shots. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. Think, um, I think what you're seeing now is sort of the natural mainstream leakage and evolution of how crypto is coming to the masses. And then I think specifically with respect to the, you know, economic cycle we may be in right now, whatever you think about COVID-19 and coronavirus, my personal opinion is that the economic response to it was a little bit louder than maybe it should have been. And maybe I'm restraining myself on my true feelings there, but um, I think, if I can recall what my pitch used to be to other people about why you should buy Bitcoin, it was more of an in investment and speculative based rationale for a traditional type of person. Now we know these opinions that have come out that say, if you don't even have 1% of your net worth in crypto or Bitcoin, not as an investment, but as an insurance hedge against global economic cycles and whether they're big, bad ones coming, um, which I think, you know, we've seen some stuff that the world has never seen before in this last cycle. And, um, you know, Bitcoin was invented for this moment. And so guys like Michael Saylor <clears throat> understand that about the economy. And I think he'd rather hedge and insure the uncertainty that may have existed in his vision and on his balance sheet to make such a move. Um, and, you know, you know, for, forget everything else where, oh, it could be the global reserve one day. And that's why, you know, guys like Winkle Voss and et cetera, and us are so bullish on saying hundred thousand a coin, 250 a coin, 1 million a coin. It's, it's certainly heading that way. Um, and I think the Michael Saylor move is more akin to, you should be insured versus I'm trying to like make a 20 X 
and maybe he'll achieve both in the process. Um, and I certainly wouldn't doubt it. Um, but yeah, to, to, to put that amount of, to make that big of a bet, I think he's understanding a lot of things that we as crypto people understand about traditional finance and, and why isn't he saying i love ethereum as much as much as i love bitcoin like or do you think that's the next evolution or i mean because yeah well and like jack I, dorsey as well like why is he not well, going I, well we've got you know 50 percent well, and i'm not compa- well i didn't compare i wouldn't compare the two and i hmm. think if you were trying to compare the two sure that's a good question to ask but I don't think there's necessarily a case like there may be for Bitcoin that Bitcoin could be a, a global alternative reserve versus Ethereum that is a Turing complete global virtual machine that enables other layers of finance to come on top of it and be processed by it. So I don't even think you could compare those two things. Um, even though earlier we were sort of discussing, yeah, there's some things that you can do on Bitcoin that that's not how it's been sold to everyone. And so until the Bitcoin community wants to say, hey, we can do what Ethereum can do, or we can enable what an, uh, Ethereum can enable, then sure, it can, it could, it has the potential to, to crush an Ethereum per se. But I don't think it will, uh, because those aren't the visions. The visions of the people were different who created them. They share a lot of common ethos. They all have a lot of the same common goals, which is to, you know, sort of add to and create a new world of open finance and leveraging cryptography and technology to do it. Um, and so Bitcoin is more of a specific narrow application where Ethereum enables specific narrow applications. Um, and so I, that's why I don't think you can compare the two. And mm. I think people only compare the two because the unit of Ethereum is ether and it has you know x dollar value and it's you know not considered number two and whatnot but i think the moment people start to look at them differently they'll be able to sort of detach that reality and mm. i think um i think with respect to maybe you know the, the chads like michael saylor putting an equivocal amount of <laughs> ethereum on your balance sheet <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet against it. I'm not going to say mm. high marks for the move, but given how I don't compare Bitcoin and Ethereum the way most people do, mm. I think there is a bullish case that that MO could happen. Because if those companies want to start interacting with those protocol layers on top of DeFi, well, then they're going to need to enter into it in order to participate. And so you may see it from that. Um, but yeah, I... Yeah, I, I I can't say no or yes either way, um, but I would say we're on the right track. And I, I you know, I mean, l- look at Grayscale, for example, with you know not having only a Bitcoin trust. So I mean, they're almost the beginning trendsetters of you know public companies having a balance sheet with not just Bitcoin on it. And so I think that trend will continue to evolve as well. I think you know as time goes on and the the BitConnects and the One Coins get caught and scammed and the the, the crappy exchanges and the rule breakers and, 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 and skaters, you know, get weeded out. Um, it will be mainstream. Uh, and, and we've got nothing but the last, I don't know, eight to 10 years of truth to that. So what, what are your thoughts on three IQ? Three IQ, Mr. Fred Pye. Well, I love Fred. I think, uh, I think, uh, you know, he, he definitely could speak to a lot of the same challenges that I spoke to as, as being an entrepreneur in the space and how hard it was to, to, to get people to understand the information you're providing them. Um, but he did it. And, um, you know, now it's just a function of as mainstream adoption continues, he's the guy with the premier, first premier fund um, in Canada. And, and, and that's Canadian dollar fund and not an fx us fund and so um you know that's unique in and of itself that's a product built in canada by canada for canada regulated clean so i'm i'm i give fred high marks and 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 i love fred personally as well yeah big fan big fan 
pretty crazy things happening, man. Okay, so what, uh, I mean, you kind of touched on it a bit, but like, you know, my whole like Peter Thiel question, um, but more like as it pertains to the world, right? And you kind of talked a bit about maybe COVID and, and Bitcoin, but just curious, do you have any like very uh, like contrarian beliefs that outside of let's say Bitcoin, right? Like, I mean, we, we've spent quite a bit of time on that. I'm sure we could talk forever on that one, but um, anything that you see that's going on in the world, um, if I had to, by the way, if I had to, if I had to list mine, uh, I would just be Rome research, but we'll leave that for another conversation. Um, you'd have to look up something called Rome research. I think it's like the one thing that nobody's talking about that it's just, <laughs> but what, what's yours? That's a tough one. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think maybe for some context, I'll just say this, uh, uh, as a hobby and not from any uh, deep understanding of mathematics or physics, I really like watching documentaries about astrophysics and quantum physics and just the sort of the high level thought experiments about, you know, the math and science they're trying to understand or work on. Um, uh, I think that um, with all the noise going around, the, the, this divisive social environment we live in this economic times we live in i think um uh okay so uh, what i was saying is there's a i don't know if you've heard this before the type zero type one type two civilizations and how man eventually can colonize the galaxies by getting to the next levels so a type zero civilization fights over tribal crap you're this i'm that you're this i'm that etc cetera, etc cetera. And so I think that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, and I'm, I know you want to stay outside, but I think what I love about this so much is that's sort of our first window back into moving towards a type one civilization. While most people could turn on the TV and think we're going completely backwards the other way. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm just, you could show me blood red everywhere and I'm just so optimistic about what the future is going to bring because of, you know, where we are at now. Like, yes, it may look bleak with the economy. Yes, half the world doesn't like President X and President Y. Okay, great. Like, um, you know, Bitcoin and tech and the internet networks are all going to be here past hundreds of presidents. Who cares? And so the more and more we stop focusing on the tribalism stuff and we start working together and sharing new ideas and sharing physics and getting into stuff that's actually going to move the needle. I think, I think a lot of people just focus on I'm this, I'm that. I think that's sort of my opinion on maximalism a little bit. Um, and, you know, I think we all just sort of need to like do more back scratching instead of uh, finger pointing, I guess. Uh, and I think we'll get closer to sort of moving through the tech, right? Like, look how fast crypto has evolved finance in like a decade. Um, yet, you know, credit cards were invented 60 years ago and like, we're still using that primitive tech. So if crypto, which is a new thing, can sort of like dwarf the amount of time it takes to replacing or advancing things or technologies or items, like I see crypto as one of the things that's doing that for man very fast brings a lot of people together who would have never got together with tons of different political views, tons of different understandings. And I think like, let's go type one and, and let's like, you know, I like crypto as sort of like so something is, that it, I- Is type two uh, then like Mars bearing or like- Yeah, type, okay, so I think, like, I think the way it's- taking us? I think the, the way it's phrased is type zero, um, you know, is very primitive and tribal and fights against each other. and you know, for resources, et cetera. A type one harnesses the power of the planet and its core. And so we don't have any more resource problems as a planet because we can get endless power from our planet. The next one is the star. And once you get to the star, we can colonize the rest of the galaxy. And you've heard people say things like, oh, well, we'll send a spacecraft to a planet that has a 3D printer that can print a copy of itself. And then it will send another one and another one and another one. You know, these are sort of the ideas um, that are going to take us forward. This is the shit Adam Back and Ethereum Vitalik thought about, maybe not specifically in the context of astrophysics and whatnot, but they weren't thinking about anything freaking tribal when they began to work on the things that they contributed to or built. Um, 
maybe you could challenge me on on Adam back and Blockstream and the, the wars and Bitcoin and whatnot. But that's not the point I'm making. It, it, it's they had to let go of a whole world of bullshit in order to bring their visions to reality. Um, and I think like in this time that we're in, you, you turn on the TV and there's just so much weirdness in our social environment right now that it makes it looks like it's going backwards when we've had never been closer at a time with crypto and blockchain and elon musks and etc to go to type one so i don't know i i never try to be bleak uh, i think a lot of the crypto people are bleak in the sense that the entire rest of the world economy is going to collapse and then we'll just be holding bitcoin and haha ha, maxi and i just like as much as like okay that it's just it's going to be some hybrid middle of that. The reality of everything is not fucking black or white. It's what kind of, how do we navigate? How do we make it fit? And then eventually things get overtaken or rewritten. And so like, I don't know, I, I don't hold a maxi view on specific items. Obviously I have principles and, you know, what I think of as a libertarian or conservative this or liberal that, et cetera. Um, but I think, uh, with all the shit that one might see negative in the world, I think, man, we are at such an awesome time. And, and we could, you know, we could definitely probably do ourselves better by saying the glass is half full than half empty. That's all. That's okay. So I got a question. Okay. Two questions. So first one is AI. Uh, do you think much about it? Um, you know, do you think it's like, uh, it's, I don't know. What are your thoughts around it? Uh, I'll just maybe. Well, as long <laughs> as uh, human decisions aren't removed from strategic defense, to quote Skynet, Terminator, I think we'll be all right. But yeah, no, AI is go on, go on. AI is brilliant. Um, you know, I think uh, I think one of the things that really sort of pierced my head open about a, three months ago was, and I'm a little late to this party. Is I watched the I watched the AlphaGo documentary. Uh, which was about, uh, you know, Google DeepMind and and the the Go board game and playing the Go Masters and things like that. And they really kind of give you a window into what DeepMind is, is working on and how it can, you know, begin to test or demonstrate some of the limits or, or uh, capabilities of AI. And I just... Uh, I just thought it was brilliant that this thing beat the Go champion, you know, four out of five times. But I equally think it's brilliant that the one match that he lost, the deep mind AI engineers, when it happened, they're like watching their systems and the memory of the AI or whatnot. And the Go master makes a move and it just basically causes the AI to go completely delusional. And it turns back to the engineer and he's like, that's the god move and it's like so there's my sort of tying it back to the last thing I, I i talked about was like i don't know there's like with all these systems that we're talking about replacing man and replacing things and etc they're all still built by us and they need to be maintained by us and i don't think ai gets to a skynet level thing anytime soon because i think the people that will build and create ai are going to use them for purposeful things like medicine or to advance computer systems or things like that i don't think we are going to want fully managed governments run by ai or you know would you trust boarding a, a commercial airliner with no pilot in it maybe but probably not um you know it's just that human it's that human thing that I think no matter how much technology you could put in front of somebody like being an organic being ourselves, I think like, you know, that sort of requirement is. Um, yeah, so, so so I guess just to maybe uh, follow up on that question. So I guess there's what we call um, like narrow AI, right, where it's like, in, like, for example, uh, my tesla it drives right. itself it's pretty freaking right. crazy but uh but then there's but that's like, this, like such a of like the singularity right yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. my point is is like there's like finance there's google could be sure. argued bitcoin in some ways is sure. ai but they're all uh essentially trying to meet one particular uh you know thing right. right um but then when i say ai what i'm really getting at is have you ever heard of a guy named raymond kurzweil yeah, yeah, yeah. So this this notion that you know a thousand dollar microchip or computer can do more more 
processing per second more thoughts per second than a human being. And then eventually, like a couple of years later, it's such that that thousand hour computer can do it, uh, you know, orders of magnitude faster than all of humanity. And it's just this like a bit of a thought experiment, but sure. you know, it's, it's one that's interesting because recently a lot of people like smart people are talking about it too, right? And it's like, what happens in let's say 30 years or whatever time frame that people are predicting 50 years, right? Pick your time frame, but then humanity gives birth to this thing that's like just insanely intelligent and is supple and it has like the kind of characteristics of humanity and it looks and feels and you know I spent 10 years in robotics before sure. I got into Bitcoin um, and I've seen kind of what these people were up to 10 years ago sure. and so so uh, I wouldn't put it past humanity to, to give birth to something that you know and and I wonder it's like well what if that happens it's like what are our checks and balances on that well, and like how do we as humanity ensure that it works in our favor right like um and that it doesn't kind of get away from us you know and doesn't like one day wake up and be like you know adam sunny bad <laughs> like must kill them um and well, strategic defense is one side of it sure it's like what happens when it says like don't turn me off or don't kill me like it just actually understands death and and you know like you've seen open ai even sure. like it's it's pretty freaky like you can you can i mean you could see a day where they can replace programmers and you know and doctors and but those are know. all narrow sorry right right so what happens when it all comes together well i might take a contrarian view here and say that i don't think that necessarily that's going to be the way we arrive at the top of whatever ai is and so, for example, yes, as human beings, we can procreate and, you know, uh, give uh, females, give birth to other human beings, et cetera. But we didn't design ourselves and we are so freaking advanced. What makes us think that we could replicate us in technology when we don't even know how us works? And it's like what you just said, like with the singularity, the maths and the science we're using for the AI they could just, they're clearly just local at the moment. So now what happens when you expand that into the quantum realm or into other areas of the universe beyond the observable universe, if there is a universe. So I think like I try to, in my life, use a lot of concepts from other disciplines and then apply them on other disciplines. And I think that everybody's dreamt up this sort of Terminator Skynet element of what AI is gonna be or the matrix type projection of AI is going to be and I just I don't even think we're number one even capable of that because of the rudimentary lack of understanding we have at the most fundamental rules of how everything works and in the quantum realm is what I'm talking about that I don't think AI gets beyond any of that until we fully know how to describe that shit. And I don't know if we ever will, because it just may be beyond our ability to understand mm, it. Mm. Yeah, I know. And, and you know, Kai Fu Lee, he, he wrote AI superpowers recently. He kind of has the same notion is that we're, you need at least four or five major breakthroughs yeah. in science. And, and we're not even close to having like one or and two that's, of those. That's why um, I brought in the type zero, one, two civilization point, because like, you know, the hubris of man is on full display when you turn on the news channels or go on the internet or et cetera. But like, we are so rudimentary um, and we think that we're not, mm. which is why we were able to come up with these huge grandiose things. And I think it kind of detracts us a little bit um, from, from what real realities could be. I mean, I, I don't mean to dismiss any type of imaginary conceptual type brain out there working on something new. Obviously, you know, I'm a university dropout, so I don't know what a nuclear physicist knows or, or a math or a scientific mathematician knows or anything like that. But, you know, I'm just, I'm just sort of, you know, kind of using, you know, some of the concepts that I, that I know about to sort of place this stuff into the world. And I don't, I just, I don't think man is capable of making AI that because we don't even understand basic things we will be required to understand to get to that level of AI we're talking about. And so, you know, that's, that's why I, I kind of lean more always on a philosophical level to like a lot of these principles in astrophysics and quantum mechanics, because they kind of break it down for, for us that we're, we're probably not as advanced or as we think we are, and we're probably not as ahead uh, as we think we are.
um, in a lot of disciplines everywhere. Quantum computing is another interest, but dude, I took up like an hour and a half of your time just like that. Um, <laughs> and we could, I, I feel like we could jam forever. So, oh, we should, forever. Uh, but, but I don't want to, I don't want to be, I want to be mindful of your, of your calendar. Um, and so look, my goal, my goal was to just ask you about your story, you know, find out sure. a little bit about BitBuy and, and jam on some of these like high level topics. But if you want, you know, next week, next month, next, whatever you want to resync and do another one of these, uh, I'd oh, be yeah. game. I definitely, Sign me I up. think we're super aligned by the way. I didn't get to share a lot of my thoughts, but I kind of felt like I was listening to a mirror in some ways, but in a different voice and body. But yeah, sure. I, think we, I think we align on a lot of things. So really, really happy. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to like put this all together. I, I interviewed Max Kaiser, Jameson Lop, and like five nice. other crazy people in the last awesome. few days. I'm going to keep going with I'm, this. I'm honored that you thought of oh, me. Oh yeah, dude. I appreciate that. Oh, no, so much respect, so much. And you know, being a Canadian, um, I, I, I want to see Canada succeed. And I've kind of, I've, I've always wanted to do something like this, where I just had these kind of conversations and made it, you know, available, but where do you think had... I got, where do you think I got the words we want to dominate Canada from? Remember a conversation we had. If, uh, oh, hey, 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 hey. No, we're kidding, aligned, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big connect one. We'll stay away from that. But uh, yeah, man, no, I totally have so much respect for you guys and your team and, and what you're doing. And I know from, you know, personal experience, it's not easy. Um, and it's not just like, oh, build some cute tech and you're good. It's sure. like you're dealing with. Uh, you know, with, with so many different moving Everything. pieces and hackers yeah, and bankers and regulators and investors and partners and, you know, a million different things. So ton of respect. And uh, yeah, man, that, that's all I got for right now. And, and like I said, let's do another resync. If you want to do kind of a reverse interview, if you're interested, if not, uh, yeah, we can just keep jamming on these crazy ideas. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Absolutely, Sonny. I, I, I really appreciate it. And uh, but before we let you before I well. let you go, can you just share kind of like the the websites and you know like your your Twitter handle, your company's website, sure. all that, just so that you know it's super clear. Sure. So um, so you can follow uh, you can follow us at uh, at Bitbuy. We are verified on Twitter, so it's just at Bitbuy. Um, of course, uh, anybody who listened to this, uh, we have a promotion going on so if you go to bitbuy.ca slash offer um, you'll get a bonus $25 when you start and make your first deposit uh, and my twitter handle if you want to follow me is uh, at goldman underscore crypto and uh, you know all views of my own on that account uh, it's a combination of retweets cool ideas and a couple shit posts here and then, and then the bitbuy twitter handle the bitbuy twitter handle is at bitbuy Awesome. Awesome. All right, buddy. We'll yeah. do this again soon. I'm going to kill the recording. <laughs>